In my previous videos, I pointed out the similarities between the Watts case and the TV show American Horror Story seasons 1 through 6. To no surprise, the similarities did not cease. So let's continue. Season 7, Cult. Meadow and Harrison Wilton receive a foreclosure notice on their house. Meadow handled all the finances and knew they were behind on their payments, yet failed to tell Harrison. Shanann had control of all the finances and never told Chris they were behind on their mortgage payments. I messed up. What? Oh my god, the bank is foreclosing on us? Whoa, 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 whoa. How long have you known about this? That says we need to be out of here in three days. I didn't want to cause you any stress. You're going to evict us from the house, Meadow. When were you going to tell me when the sheriff is here to throw us out? How the hell did this happen? You said we were on solid ground. Well, it can't be that much of a surprise. Our mortgage is $1,500 a month. We're not bringing enough in on your income alone. My income? So you're blaming it on me? No, no, no. You handle the money, Meadow. This is all your fault. It's my fault. Kai Anderson tells Beverly Hope he has an IQ of 135. Chris tells investigators in his second confession he had to take 11 tests to figure out his IQ was 135 or 140. Who are you? I'm Kai Anderson. I'm 30 years old. I was in the Army. I served a tour in Iraq. Came home and graduated in three from Yale with a double degree in poli sci and feminist studies. I have a brown belt in karate. I have a 135 IQ and I'm running for city council. Beverly runs into B.B. Babbitt, who explains to her how the male desperately wants to be led by females. Chris has always been the beta to the alpha women in his life and never seemed to mind Shanann being the one in charge. Winter tells Allie that she loved Ivy and she felt what they had was real. When investigators ask Chris if he loved Kessinger, he tells them he thought the relationship was true. He seduced my wife. You use her to destroy me and my family. I'm sorry I let things get so out of control. But you have to believe me. I cared about Ivy. I did. It was real, whatever you want to call it. Beverly asked Allie how she came out of the whole situation smelling like a rose. She explains the FBI came to her and were already suspicious of Kai. She was extremely useful to the FBI and they offered her immunity. How did you get so lucky to come out smelling like a rose? The FBI came to see me when Vincent put me in the psychiatric ward. They had their suspicions about Kai back then after the assassination attempt. And that's when you joined the cult? I became invaluable to the FBI, and in return, I got immunity. Kessinger erased all the content from her phone and lied to investigators a number of times. Surprisingly, she was treated as a victim instead of a suspect and was never investigated. Although it is only speculation, many believe that she may have been offered a plea deal and received immunity in return. Kai pleads guilty to everything when the DA offers him a plea deal, avoiding a trial in order to save himself from the death penalty. Chris confessed to all of the murders after the DA offered him a plea deal, waiving a trial, and avoided getting the death penalty. You must have heard. Kai pled guilty to everything. He's not going to trial. That doesn't surprise you. Why do you care? Because I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. Why didn't he turn me in? They took me in the night of the raid and let me go. Not another word since. Beverly, you didn't fit the profile. A black woman in a cult of angry white nationalists. They thought you were an unwilling victim. You were the informant. Isn't that what you told them? I told them the truth. 
I didn't see that you were involved in any crime, except being subservient to those misogynistic assholes. That still doesn't explain what Kai did or didn't do. The DA offered a plea. He waves a trial to save himself from the death penalty. He's such a narcissist, he couldn't bear to have anyone else take credit. The Smith Modernization Act of 2012 made it legal for the U.S. government to push propaganda on U.S. citizens through social media in order to coerce U.S. citizens to believe whatever narrative the U.S. government wants them to believe. Propaganda is information, ideas, opinions, or images often only giving one part of an argument that are broadcast or in some other way spread with the intention of influencing people's opinions. False flags are one form of propaganda the U.S. government uses on U.S. citizens and are designed to install fear, panic, and a guided response from the general public. False flags come in all different forms. They can be small or large, domestic or foreign, economic or political, and each one will serve a specific purpose. How to spot a false flag Is it a high-profile incident that gained widespread mainstream media attention? Does the story keep changing in order to fit the narrative of the individuals perpetrating the event? Who benefits from all of it? Usually the ones to gain are the government, banks, and major corporations. Is there unanswered questions about the event, such as details of the crime or possible motive? Was the case quickly closed? Was the patsy or suspect killed during or shortly after the event, thus avoiding firsthand contradiction of the official narrative? Was there predictive programming of the event used in movies or television? This might involve a depiction of the actual event or have conspicuous or inconspicuous random details in a movie or television show. Does the Watts case contain any of these false flag elements? Let's review. Is it a high profile case? Does the story keep changing? Did anybody benefit? Are there unanswered questions? Was the case closed quickly? Was there predictive programming? Pay close attention to what Kai is saying. His statement is very significant and just might be the answer that many have been searching for. The world has become tiny, which means the fear in a small town in Michigan can infect the country, the world, in a few days. Fear, fear isn't like a virus. When fear finds more hosts, it gets stronger, scarier. The tiny fear in one woman turns into a beast that swallows the world by the time it spreads across the country. Great men and women have been weaponizing fear forever. But what all those men had was a great messenger. Someone with a pulpit and a microphone. Someone to give that fear a name. Believe me, Beverly Hope. If you get the world scared enough, it will set the world on fire for us.